Hey everybody. So today I'm gonna to be talking about architecting a cloud native internet time machine. Quickly about me, I'm currently a product manager at NodeSource and I'm also a member of the Node.js evangelism working group. So I like to go to meetups and help with Node schools to uh, help evangelize Node. I think everybody should be using Node and that's, uh, that's why I'm here. I also have an introduction to CoreOS video tutorial series with O'Reilly Media. And if you're interested in finding me on the internet, I am at Ross Kukulinski, very original. So getting started, what does cloud native mean? Well, it means lots of things, uh, depending on who you ask and what they're trying to accomplish. But uh, someone that I, I follow quite a bit on, on Twitter, Joe Beta, who just had a new startup, um, Hept.io, had this to say, at its root, cloud native is structuring teams, culture, and technology to utilize automation and architectures to manage complexity and unlock velocity. So for me, some of the key takeaways from this is that it's not just technology. Now, you just can't shove everything, everything into a container and say, great, we're cloud native, we're ready to go. It's just one part of it. And, but what I really love about cloud native is that when it's done right, it enables developers to own the life cycle of their applications, from development through QA all the way to production. So the same reasons that I'm so excited about Node in that it enables agility and development joy, cloud native procedures and technologies enable that same thing. But I work with a lot of developers uh, and a lot of the developers I work with, they're not really sure where to begin with learning operations or metrics or logging or distributed tracing. They want to learn, but they're not sure how. And for many of them, they're not lucky enough to be in an organization that already has these types of systems in place, that are already trying to do DevOps or do cloud native. So how are those people supposed to learn and hone these skills? Now, there's uh, an engineer, uh, Angelina Magnum, who did a really, really awesome talk uh, at JSConf 2013. I was not there, but I watched online, along with 120,000 other people on YouTube. I highly recommend watching this uh, video if you're interested in trying to level up from a beginner or an intermediate developer to an advanced developer. And it's not just JavaScript. But some of the key takeaways, the big key takeaway that, that I really took from uh, Angelina's talk was this idea of experimenting recklessly. Throw caution to the wind, try something dangerous, and see what happens. If it doesn't work, that's okay. Figure out what went wrong, how you might change it to make it better, and try again. But recklessly, reckless, recklessness can be very, very dangerous uh, for an organization. So you really, as a developer, you want a safe environment to do this. Really, you want a sandbox. You want a place where you can experiment and experience these things recklessly. And you want to be able to figure out how to actually build these things. And so for me, this is something that as I was working with more and more developers that are trying to do cloud native, and I've been working with containers since 2013, Kubernetes in 2015, I've been doing this for a while and I've felt the pains and the agony of trying to learn how to do these things myself. I have experimented recklessly and felt the pain. And I realized that there's, there's so many resources out there for us as developers, right? You can go buy a book, there's eBooks, there's video courses, I have a video course. The moment I shipped my video course, it was outdated. <laughs> The core concepts were right, but the actual implementation details were no longer accurate. It wasn't best practices anymore because we move in a space that moves so quickly. So I wanted to create a sandbox that was entirely open source that would enable developers like myself and other people to experiment recklessly. We should be able to publish and document everything that we learn and experience. What are the best practices? What are the lessons learned? We should have a supportive and inclusive uh, mentorship and discussion system. So everyone should be feel welcome to contribute or try or learn or just lurk. Just read the design docs and see what you can figure out. But more importantly, as I've read so many Hello World apps in my life, that uh, I didn't want to have a Hello World app. I wanted something real. I wanted something that was solving a real problem using cloud native technologies and procedures. So after some uh, soul searching and brainstorming and talking with other people that I've been working with, we stumbled across the Wayback Machine. So who here is familiar with the Wayback Machine? Raise your hand. All right, that's, so a lot of people are. If you're not familiar, that's okay. Essentially what the Wayback Machine does is it crawls the internet based on users' requests and it will catalog an entire website. It'll cache it all and then you can go to internet uh, archive.org. 
You can go back and search any URL. You can go back and see what the Facebook looked like in 2009 or 2008 when it first came out. It's very different from today. And <laughs> Wayback Machine uh, is an entire open source organization, or the, the organization is, is a, a non-profit. Their goal is to catalog and archive the internet for all of us to see what the history of the internet is. And from an engineering perspective, the Internet Archive is huge. There's been a ton of research papers published on the Internet Archive and their architecture. Um, this paper that's up here, um, the architecture of the Internet Archive by Elliot Huffey and Scott Kirkpatrick, uh, in this paper they describe in 2009, so this is 2009, the Internet Archive was serving 2.3 gigabytes of data per second to its users. In 2014, they had cataloged 15 petabyte, petabytes of information. And by 2016, which is early this year, uh, 430 billion web pages were archived, and they were adding 5 billion new URLs in the last year. So this is a real system at real scale. And for me, this is an interesting problem. How might I go and build and implement a cloud uh, time machine? Now, when they first built the Internet Archive, they had some very, very, they had four real simple rules. Very, very simple design goals, which for me as an engineer, I loved. Number one, the system should use only commodity equipment. So this is, when they first built this, they built their own data center. They now operate three different data centers. The system should not rely on any commercial software. So it's either all open source or they build it themselves and then, and then make it available. Uh, and they actually, they went ahead and built their own file store. So like we've got S3 and Amazon, this like sort of next generation cloud file store system. They actually built their own in 1996. And if you go read the research papers, they're actually remarkably similar. The system should not require a PhD to implement or maintain. This is good. I don't have a PhD, but I want to be able to understand how these components fit together. How do they work? Uh, and anyone should be able to approach and work on this. And the system should be as simple as possible. Obviously, there's constraints, but we should strive to make it as simple as possible. So the Internet Archive provided a tractable problem. And in theory, we should build something that's easy to maintain. And hopefully, it's fun. And so we built Cloudy Time Machine. It's a cloud-native, microservice-based implementation of the Wayback Machine. Initially, when we created this, we actually called it the Lazy Internet Archive. Uh, and I'll get to that in a little bit. And I do want to make an important note. This is not production ready. We are not trying to put the real internet archive out of business. They are a huge organization. They're doing the right things for, for us as an internet uh, community. This is a problem, or this is a sandbox, right? We want to experiment recklessly. It is entirely open source. It's all on GitHub. You can go to github.com slash cloudy time machine. We leverage Circle CI for automated CI and CD system. And all the images are uh, hosted on Quay, Quay.io, which is a, a Docker registry. Uh, and they're all public. All of this is public. So uh, let's take a look and see, whoops. Let's see if we can take a look at this. Might open in the wrong window. There it is. Oh, now I can't see it. That's funny. Uh, so here, down here, I should be able to type in, so I'm a big fan of uh, xkcd.com. So, in our lazy wayback machine, instead of crawling and pulling out all the index.html and all the HTML and the CSS and images and transpiling all of them and rewriting all the URLs, we were lazy. We just used PhantomJS and took a nice big snapshot of that and then shoved it into Google's uh, file store. Uh, we also can go back and look at the history. So uh, we can go back and see what XKCD looked like uh, over the last uh, few days or weeks, however many people actually went through and uh, worked with that. I'm missing it. So just a different UI look and feel on how all this all works. All right, so let's go back here to slides. All right. So what does it look like? Well, Cloudy Time Machine is a React and Webpack front end. We have a public-facing REST API documented entirely with Swagger. Uh, in theory, we could generate client-side libraries for this using Swagger's tools. We haven't done that yet. It is a Node.js microservice architecture. It is Node, but it doesn't have to be. 
because this is all in containerized containers, uh, and it has a well-documented microservice-based uh, message bus system, we could, in theory, rewrite any part of this in a different language if we wanted to. In fact, we have someone who's working on a Go implementation of the screenshot software. We do use message queues for our internal APIs, so all the services communicate using a message queue. Uh, in this case, it's currently Redis. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, and from day one, this has been containerized, 100%. It's leveraging Docker and Kubernetes. Uh, in this current production deployment, it's running in Google's container engine. It doesn't have to be. It, could run, it, it is technically cloud agnostic. Uh, however, we are leveraging uh, Google's cloud storage API. So right now, we write directly to Google's file store. Uh, in theory, the service that uh, is responsible for writing that could take an environmental variable and switch between AWS or GCP or Azure or maybe even uh, a local file store solution. We're leveraging RethinkDB for all the metadata about all the snapshots. And then, as I mentioned, we're using CI CD uh, for all the deployments. So here's the top level architecture. So at the top, we have our Nginx proxy layers. So those are simply proxying to the two major front end surface, uh, services. The first is the front end uh, single page app, that React app. It is actually served up by Nginx. So we've got an Nginx talking to another Nginx. On the API side, node based, we're using Restify to communicate. And RethinkDB is providing, again, that caching layer. Redis is the jobs uh, system, is the job processing. So when a request comes in to take a snapshot, that gets written to Redis. And then one of the uh, screenshot workers pulls from Redis, will then start doing that processing, talk to the internet, take the screenshot, and then upload it to uh, the Google Cloud Storage. And then that information is then sort of relayed back through Redis uh, to the API service, which then writes uh, to RethinkDB. So uh, what are some of the lessons learned? Well, first of all, it's fun to experiment recklessly. We've tried a lot of different things that have worked and a lot of things that haven't worked. One of the big takeaways is that we recognize that Kubernetes really is great for developers. Uh, containers themselves, developers, if they're going to have to deploy something, they want to think about their application. They want to deploy an app. They don't want to deploy a virtual machine or some other thing. They just want to say, oh, I've got my app and I want to get it out there. Well, a container is a one-to-one -one mapping to that application you have. So for developers, it's very, uh, it's very easy to understand how your application then behaves in this containerized space. Uh, a nod to node source and the, community, uh, the Kubernetes open source project, uh, design docs are critical. So when we're proposing an idea or we have an idea or something we want to improve or change, we're at a design doc. What are our goals? What's the executive summary? What do we think? What are the alternatives that we've considered? And then if we do some experimentation, we then have a result. And so we can say, OK, this is what we're going to go with. Ship early and ship often. When we, as we were building the first version of this, which was a one-day hackathon with myself and another person, uh, we built CI/CD from the beginning, which made our life easy the rest of the time. So we had automatically building and deploying. Initially, it wasn't deploying anywhere, but it at least was building, and we had tests. And the next stage was, all right, well, let's stand up a cluster and actually deploy to a staging, and then uh, production. And it made our iterative cycle as we were testing and validating uh, incredibly fast. Another important element that we recognized is that containers scale independently of your cloud provider. So if you're using a container orchestration system like Docker, or a Docker Swarm, or Mesos, or Kubernetes, if those systems are already deployed onto some number of hosts, and you realize that you need to scale up maybe your front end application, scaling up is just a question of adding more instances of that container in the existing machines you have. So if you have available capacity already, you just add more containers. Obviously, if you're out of capacity, you have to add new machines. This is different from a system where you are deploying new virtual machines. If you're deploying new virtual machines, you have to make sure you're hoping and praying that your cloud provider has the ability to deploy those machines. If they have downtime, you can't deploy. If they're out of capacity in US East 1, you can't deploy. Another important element is that microservices are not a magic bullet. They shift complexity around. They move complexity out of your application into the orchestration layer. And so that's why we need things like distributed tracing and monitoring and distributed logging to have an understanding of what your overall system is doing. Each individual application is much more simple, but the overall system is still complex. Finally, documenting and versioning of streaming API, APIs is still kind of difficult. Uh, we, for REST API world, there's a Swagger documentation spec. It's pretty great for, for developing, building uh, REST APIs. But there really isn't equivalent that I've found uh, for 
streaming APIs or message bus APIs. It tends to depend on which, you know, there might be something specific to a specific uh, message bus system, but there's no generic one that I found. And we've also built some open source tools. So containerizing stateful services is still hard. There's no way around that. Uh, because we're using RethinkDB, uh, we built out a, a pre-baked uh, Kubernetes deployment of RethinkDB. Uh, and that made it very easy for us to manage and deploy these things. And it's actually gotten picked up. There's actually a number of companies that are now using this uh, in production, which is cool. It's also, it's okay to have opinions. Uh, so we realized that there was a lot of, as we were adding more and more services to our system, that we were copy and pasting deploy code. How do we build and deploy and manage the, the CI CD system? And so we ended up building something that we call K8S or Kates or Kubernetes scripts. Basically is a declarative syntax for managing uh, building and deploying of your applications uh, to Kubernetes. So what's next? Well, more tests. Always need more tests. In fact, we have very few tests. Biggest, big, big shame on us. Uh, we're also experimenting with ephemeral environments for PR testing. So when we get a new PR for one of our, one of our modules, we really want to spin up a whole new instance, like one instance of every container, so we have a complete functioning instance of Cloudy Time Machine, with the only change being that one PR. We're also looking to switch to a language agnostic message bus. Right now we're relying on a library called Bull, which builds off of Redis, it's an NPM module. Uh, it, it's worked very, very well for us, but it is specific to Node.js. There is no equivalent for Go, or Java, or Ruby, or anything else. And so if we have other developers that want to come on board and try to experiment with a different language, I want to experiment with Go, I have to go write a Go implementation of Bull before I can actually get any work done. So we're looking to switch, uh, replace Redis with a, a new message bus system called Nats, uh, which I've been following for a long time. And then finally, we're going to sort of try to dive in more into the streaming API documentation and validation. Now, if any of this is interesting to you and you want to see more or see what it's actually like, tomorrow morning I'm running a workshop with my coworker Nathan White called Deploying and Scaling Node.js with Kubernetes tomorrow at 9 a.m. And we will actually be deploying Cloudy Time Machine on Kubernetes in the workshop. I've got a whole lot of resources here. I've done a bunch of research on this, sort of learning more about Cloudy Time Machine. So I think it's important to always tip your hat to uh, the resources you've used. And thank you. Okay, we've got some time for some questions. So if anybody has any questions, please raise your hand. Oh, come on. <laughs> I have a question. Let's hear it. Um, you mentioned uh, the extremely large and ambitious project that you did in a day hackathon, um, a distributed node-based cloud architecture. Um, how were you able to pull that off without, or, or did you have any kind of financial resources backing you to do uh, that? My credit card is paying for Cloudy Time Machine. <laughs> uh, so if there's a foundation that is interested in this for benchmarking or other things, I would love to have a conversation with them. Uh, <laughs> but in reality, uh, you know, I use this for talking with customers and people that are interested in learning about this. Um, so it turns out to not be that expensive, mostly because it's not very popular. No one really goes to it. <laughs> uh, and so, I mean, we have, we have automated uh, machines that pre-seed data that, that have a list of, I think we've got a thousand URLs that we cache every day. So we have consistent traffic spread out through the day, sort of fake data <laughs> to make the system actually usable uh, and actually work with it. Um, but it's actually pretty cheap. And I should also note that uh, the first prototype was a one day. <laughs> we've actually been working on this for a while now. All right. So it's final making me now. feel better. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, it, especially the front end. There was no front end in the first version because I don't do front end development. Gotcha. So what was it like actually uh, deploying this production? How long did it take to actually get that up? And then, like, iteratively, how, how, how difficult has that been? Have you had any challenges with that? So we, we built the first version the first day, and that first day we had CI, CD deploying to Google Container Engine. Okay. Um, we didn't have a staging environment at first. We were just, all right, let's just ship to production because no one's using it. So if we break it, who cares? Uh, but then we have a process. So then if I ship something new and one of the other people that's working with me on the project and they're trying out their thing and something is broken, they can say, hey, Ross, you 
did you break something? And I go, yeah, probably. <laughs> um, so I think that having that immediate sort of, I want that immediate feedback. Like if I ship something, I want to know, do my tests pass? Do my integration tests pass? Does it ship the staging and is it workable? And then let's watch it for a day. And we have automated tests or automated systems that are basically doing queries against it. Uh, let's see what the graphs look like. Is the system still happy? Oh, it's still happy, great. Let's press the big scary ship to production button. What was the, uh, the biggest challenge in this? <laughs> Was the biggest hurdle? Uh, finding a front-end developer. <laughs> um, I think we're out of time now, but thank you so much. That was excellent. <laughs>